right, uh, Chancellor, now we'll hear about an update on Student Success Initiative implementation. Thanks very much, President Bacher, members of the board. Um, I think uh, the last, uh, yesterday and today are, are quite uh, informative. And uh, as I am sure you have noticed, we have moved through a number of uh, components of an overall agenda. And we're now going to turn to uh, an update on the student success uh, initiative implementation that uh, Eric Skinner is going to provide. And I, I would simply say that all these pieces are leading uh, to the sort of puzzle you saw in the Senate presentation a moment ago that they are designed to fit together. So this is a very important component. And when Eric finishes, I'll uh, try to wrap this together with the, the uh, system strategic plan. Eric? President Baca, Chancellor Harris, members of the board. Um, this item is a comprehensive update and overview of uh, uh, progress on the Board of Governors Student Success Initiative. And uh, as Chancellor Harris just pointed out, it, it is, uh, I, I think, uh, uh, worth, worth noting the number of presentations you've heard over uh, today and yesterday that really relate to this from, you know, the, the work in SB 1440, the Associate Degrees for Transfer, uh, the Foundations update this morning. Um, the, the Academic Senate's presentation. It, it really is, a, there's a, a, a lot of very important good work that's going on across the system and it's happening on a lot of fronts. Um, but, but to a great extent, that was sparked by um, uh, the Student Success Task Force and the, um, the energy that, that was uh, created when the Board of Governors adopted that agenda. And so uh, I, I guess, uh, you know, success has many parents and so we ought to, you know, the, um, it's, uh, you know, part of what we are, what we're always mindful of here is the fact that um, it, it's taken um, many partnerships and, and uh, the support of, of from, from really all, all corners of our system and from the capital to make this, um, uh, to help us achieve the progress that's been made to date. Um, so I, what I'd like to do is to, to start by kind of looking back uh, briefly and just uh, kind of stepping through some of the chronology of, uh, of kind of um, of uh, the student success initiative, um, so first looking back to uh, January of 2011, that's when uh, Senate Bill 1143, carried by Carol Liu, became law. This this was the legislation that initially would have uh, instituted a form of performance funding for the California Community Colleges. Uh, as that bill moved through the legislative process, we spoke up loudly uh, that we were concerned with the unintended consequences that would come from a performance funding model and that we thought there was a better way to achieve the objective of improving student success rates. Uh, and so the model that emerged from that was, was the uh, um, charging the system, charging you as a board with pulling together a student success task force who would, uh, th that would look at this issue of, of improving s success rates in the California community colleges and come up with an action plan to get that done. And so um, that SB 1143 in the, in the form that was actually, that was finally enacted and signed by the governor um, called on uh, you to establish that task force. And so that, uh, I would say the first success of this effort was, was to steer away from a performance funding model back into a more thoughtful uh, review of student success. Um, within, within, within weeks of the, uh, the uh, of SB 1143 becoming law, uh, uh, the, the board uh, pulled, pulled together a, uh, a task force, uh, 21 members uh, representing faculty, uh, students, uh, classified staff, uh, researchers from both, both within the system and outside the, the system, uh, the business community, really a broad uh, representation of stakeholders. And uh, the, the, help, the group, the task force, held its first meeting in January, literally within weeks of the, of the enactment of SB 1143. I would say a lot, a lot of the foundational work that, that allowed that to move forward the way it did uh, came from the leadership of, of uh, um, the uh, president of the board at the time, Scott Himmelstein. Uh, it came from uh, Chancellor Jack Scott. And uh, the, um, the, the task force was chaired by Peter McDougall who provided uh, great insight and le strength and leadership to that, that initiative. And then on the task force, we had um, um, President Baca and uh, Chancellor Harris in his former role as Chancellor of the Los Rios District. 
Um, so m many of the people that were really pivotal to making this move forward are in, in the room and uh, or, or um, you know, are still very much um, on, on the scene here. The, um, the so the task force uh, met over the course of a year. It was a very in depth uh, and rigorous review of of uh, student success in the California community colleges and really they approached their charge with uh, with this in mind that they the goal was to improve success and completion rates for California community college students but we need to find strategies to do that that also protect equity that also work to ensure that as we improve our success rates that we don't leave students behind that we find ways to uh, help all all students, students from all backgrounds, to achieve their their goals at, at greater rates. And from the very beginning, it was a, a, a uh, implicit and explicit part of the of the t of the charge, um, very much baked into into the the task force's review and its ultimately its recommendations that those twin goals of of improving success rates but while also driving forward an equity agenda, they, they go hand in hand and they're, they're really what we're about as a system and we're not gonna step away from that. So over the course of the year, the task force looked at um, re really every aspect of how the colleges uh, operate. They, they looked at uh, uh, volumes of, d of data on student performance. They heard uh, experts from within California and from around the nation and uh, uh, examined in particular effective models that, that have been shown to, to produce higher higher success rates. The um, <clears throat> what and what emerged from that uh, that work was a um, a, a report uh, re with 22 uh, specific recommendations on on um, changes that the system could make at multiple levels at the in terms of state policy in terms of, of funding, in terms of our regulations, and in terms of local policy that could be, uh, that would be effective at, at moving towards this, this goal of improved success uh, while also uh, holding firm to, the, to an equity agenda. And the, um, th those recommendations went to the Board of Governors in, in January of 2012. Um, there was uh, some discord. Uh, I think you all remember that meeting. Um, and. Uh, these weren't, uh, you know, th these were substantial changes, and I think anytime you're talking about significant changes, it always, you know, it's going to, uh, um, you know, ch challenge. It, it will challenge some people, and I, I, you know, it's to the credit of this board that you, uh, you held firm and it, you not unanimously adopted those 22 recommendations, and really launched uh, an era of transformation for our system. Th those 22 recommendations um, affect virtually every aspect of how the colleges and how the college system um, operates and um, the um, and, and really laid, laid a, a, a road map uh, for transforming our system in, into a in, into a system that, that allows students to achieve their goals at much higher um, much higher rates the 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 uh, the next step in the process was to uh, develop an implementation plan and strategy, and uh, essentially the uh, you know that that work involved uh, bringing together uh, work groups representing li literally hundreds of, of stakeholders from across the system, uh, really folks from from every background and, and uh, kind of category within our system again students faculty uh, staff um, and. Uh, to examine those 22 recommendations and develop very concrete uh, plans for, for their implementation. And uh, it, it really, uh, the, um, the, the progress that's been made so far is absolutely um, the result of, of, that, of those contributions from those experts from across our system have come together to, to assist in, in, in crafting the specific policies and regulations and procedures that will allow this to work. So, at at this point in time, um, the uh, well, there, there's one one other piece of the chronology that I'd like to just uh, step forward to, which is um, the w one of the one of the key implementation strategies that the uh, the board employed was to sponsor legislation in SB 1456, uh, carried by Senator Alan Lowenthal, and that legislation that was introduced and ultimately signed into law by the governor 
um, codified some of the basic frameworks of this student success initiative. In particular, the, uh, the recrafting of our, what was known as the matriculation program. So our, our core student success program um, was recrafted to, to, to focus it on the, those practices that we know to be effective at helping students achieve their goals. And at its, at its core, it's really about doing a better job of helping students when they arrive at a, at a, at a, at a community college to identify a goal, to develop an education plan, to go through a proper assessment and placement in order to get in the classes they need to achieve that goal, and then provide the student with the support as they move forward to stay on that path. And th that's a type of structure that has been shown to be very effective at helping students achieve. And oftentimes, in, in the history of our system, just candidly, th that structure has been lacking. And that's because of a lack of resources at times. It's be been because of different edu uh, kind of philosophies on the, the educational uh, process, but for whatever reason, uh, it, it's been lacking. And so the uh, SB 1456 called for a refocusing of those efforts and for a reinvestment in, in those uh, key student support efforts. Uh, SB 1456 also laid the groundwork, <coughs> actually called on the Board of Governors to establish academic um, minimum uh, thresholds of, of uh, performance in order to, for students to be eligible to receive the Board of Governors fee waiver. So that, that was an item that was up, obviously, uh, ye yesterday for a first reading before you. Uh, but, but 1456 also th um, laid, that, um, um, laid the framework for that change. So th that's some of the key chronology. Um, a as I said, the, the, the 22 recommendations really um, you know, run the gamut from statutory changes, which I just noted, to regulatory changes, to policy changes and infusion of, bud, of, of resources, of you know, bu budget, budget actions. The, at, at this point uh, in time, in terms of kind of t assessing where we're at right now in terms of pro progress, um, I, I would draw your attention to the, uh, the, this, the handout that's the, uh, the landscape uh, matrix that has become our, our tracking tool to uh, um, um, monitor where we are in terms of implementing the 22 recommendations. Um, the, uh, on this document, you'll see that, that at this point in time, all 22 uh, recommendations are in, in the implementation process. So work has begun on all 22 recommendations. Six of the recommendations have been fully completed. Um, and uh, we, can, we could step through that. Um, the the, the key, key elements that have been uh, put in place so far are it's um, Recommendation 2.5, which is requiring students to, de to declare a program of study. Um, the, the requirement is that they declare a program of study by, their, by the time they've earned their 15th unit. Um, and uh, that is built into uh, um, both the enrollment priority regulations and also into the student success and support program um, uh, framework. Again, back to that, that providing students with that structure of, of, of uh, Putting a focus on identifying a goal when, when the, early in the process when a student arrives at a college, the um, on on the on page two the uh, adoption of system wide enrollment priorities. This was a uh, an early so this is recommendation three point one. This is a, was one of the the uh, earliest um, steps taken by the board, uh, and that was because uh, it was um, within the authority of the board already within the existing uh, statutory framework and so uh, you you as a board had the the uh, the, the power to proceed with these regulations um, and be and um, and so we expedited that process and you very early in the in the in the process established this this set of system-wide enrollment priorities that essentially provide students with with a higher uh, registration priority if they step through if they take the the, the, uh, the steps that are shown to, to improve their success rates. So that's identifying the goal, that's developing an education plan, that's going through an assessment and orientation process. And essentially the, the students, if they take those proactive steps to help themselves, are rewarded by receiving a higher registration priority. So it's, it's building an incentive into the, for the student. Um, conversely, if a student fails to avail themselves of those supports, or if a student fails to make 
academic progress um, as defined by the, the, the well, essentially if their grade point average drops below a 2.0 for two consecutive terms or if they fail to complete at least half of the units attempted for two consecutive terms. So it's a fairly low bar, but if, if a student is not making that minimum threshold of progress, again, they lose priority, they move further back. So it's built, building in some incentives and disincentives into the re enrollment uh, registration priorities uh, to uh, try to promote student success. Um, the uh, promoting the, 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 moving on to the next item, the uh, promoting the benefits of full-time uh, attendance. Uh, this recommendation 3.3, uh, the, the Chancellor's Office developed some best practices and uh, through uh, some research and talking with experts across our system in terms of effective models for promoting uh, full-time attendance and we uh, developed materials and, and shared those with uh, student services officers in particular. And uh, so we sent that out. I, I, would, I would say that th this particular recommendation shows perhaps though that uh, I think all these recommendations you know, there will be various levels of completion. Disseminating some effective practices is clearly forward progress. It was enough for us to feel we could plant the flag in the ground and say we've done something significant there. But, but this, this will continue to be an ongoing uh, process. And I think the same would go for many of these recommendations, that there will always be the, the, uh, the need, uh, the opportunity to continue to hone them, to improve them, to build upon them uh, to, for more effective implementation. Is it possible to get a copy of them? Yes. I, you've shared them, but that doesn't mean that people in districts are then widely disseminating them. Fair point. After, after we can share Not them with you. Not a problem and, yeah. on your part, but on what can happen once something goes out. If yeah. it'd be possible to see it, I'd be very appreciative. We can do that, and again, I, I think this, this one really co does call out that uh, uh, th this work will never be done. Right. It, we, we always need to do more and, and do a better job. Okay, and I'll try to speed it up so there's time for, for conversation. Um, the uh, 5.1, the alternative basic skills curriculum. Uh, again, this is one of those key work groups. Uh, faculty, um, uh, classified staff students were brought together to, to look at, uh, at basic skills and uh, effective and promising practices. They assembled, uh, and this was under le the leadership of Vice Chancellor Russell, um, th and um, the uh, the result of, of that s the, the summit was to uh, I identify promising and effective practices to assemble them into this uh, uh, a, a guide for the field that was distributed. I believe you, uh, you received copies uh, at, at this board meeting, um, and the um, so so again it's an, an attempt to try to leverage what we've learned as a system and the and the innovation including. Uh, you know um, the, uh, the you know the pre presentation you heard yesterday um, um, that we there are many effective practices ar around the state and uh, an important um, you know focus of this student success initiative really is to identify those effective practices and to share them to dis disseminate them so that they can be um, modeled and replicated and and um, adopted elsewhere. Um, the uh, next item is on page uh, three, which is the accountability uh, scorecard. So this is the student success scorecard. This is a, a major a major step forward for the system in terms of refocusing and um, uh, the what had been the ARC, the accountability reporting for the California Community Colleges. That document was, uh, while it was full of information. It was oftentimes uh, difficult to, to uh, get to the point. The, um, what the scorecard did was to distill that, that report down and um, key in on very specific um, indicators around uh, not only completion of high order outcomes such as earning a certificate, transferring, earning a degree, but also those intermediate kind of um, progress points such as completing 30 units, uh, completing a remedial sequence, that those those type of intermediate tipping point metrics were also included on that scorecard. And um, the uh, importantly, the scorecard also uh, disaggregates the um, um, performance data for, for, for each college based on uh, demographic subgroups, race, ethnicity, gender, uh, 
and uh, we're working towards including uh, uh, disability and also uh, some economic um, measures of, of students' uh, performance as well. And with the, again, back to this piece about wanting to promote an equity agenda, wanting to work towards um, um, identifying achievement gaps and working to close those gaps. So this, the scorecard is, is absolutely a, a cornerstone of, of your work and will um, provide a framework for local boards to drive their, their local program policy decisions, their local budget decisions to try to move the needle on these success metrics. Um, and then on page four, the uh, investing, uh, or rather the categorical program streamlining and cooperation, uh, there, there are a couple initiatives, one, one housed in the student success, I mean rather in the, the student support division in which they uh, are conducting um, it's, a, it's an an annual review process where they are al aligning and better coordinating the, uh, the categorical program requirements in order to simplify implementation at the local level. Th this, this recommendation was really intended to, to try to break down silos across various categorical programs to ensure that resources at the local level are being used in a way that's very much coordinated and, and aligned um, uh, as opposed to in a kind of fragmented, siloed uh, approach. And so we, we modeled that at the, the chancellor's office level by uh, as we lay out the, the guidelines and reporting requirements for these programs, we um, have worked to align that. And I would say perhaps in an even more visible, externally visible way uh, within the Workforce and Economic Development Division, uh, uh, Vice Chancellor Tone Quinn, Quinn Livin has uh, through the uh, Doing What Matters uh, initiative really work to braid the categorical programs to in a very um, uh, very real way to uh, ensure that those resources resources are being used in, a, in, a, in an aligned and coordinated fashion so th those are the the recommendations that have been fully uh, implemented to date I, I would say kind of as we kind of the my last point I was going to um, look forward a, a bit and, and make kind of foreshadow where we're, we're headed um, you know, ha having at this point in time fully implemented uh, six of the 22 recommendations, having all 22 in, in, in play, in, in progress, uh, uh, we, we believe it's significant. I, I would add, though, that I, I we're, there, there are at least two or three recommendations that, that, you're, that are on the, on the cusp of, of being adopted, including the, the uh, adoption of the Board of Governors fee waiver uh, changes that was uh, underwent a, a first reading yesterday. Um, the, um, and, uh, the, and there's a, an, another handful of uh, six or seven recommendations that, that are very, very much fully in gear. And over the course of this next year, you will hear much about and there'll be significant progress. And I, I would just, I would note that those include um, the, the state budget provided resources to support uh, $14 million for some, for, for some technology tools. Uh, and these really, um, include education planning tools. So the, these are uh, uh, electric online based tools for uh, both students, but also counselors and, and advisors to uh, automate and to, um, to uh, use information technology to, to really uh, uh, to support and advance education planning for students. Um, this is going to be a, a productivity tool uh, that it's going to allow counselors and advisors to have a greater influence on more students. It's going to allow students to be empowered and, and, and access information on their own. And, and so that the, the $14 million will help uh, support the expansion of that. Uh, yesterday at your meeting, you, you uh, approved the grants to uh, get that rolling. Um, so that's recommendation 2.1. Um, and then there's also, uh, I'm sorry, rather, that's uh, 2.3. Um, in addition, the, the budget, part of that $14 million was to support the development of, of improved assessment tools for the, for the uh, California community colleges with a focus on a common assessment. Uh, those resources will be used to, again, to, to build a better assessment tool for our, our colleges and, and um, uh, a, a better infrastructure to support the mobility of scores across, across colleges. We, we awarded, awarded those grants yesterday, too. That's correct. Yeah. So that was included. So that's, uh, those are recommendations 2.1 and 2.4 are, are included in that. Um, your, your system budget request, uh, I'm 
shifting gears now in the professional development. So these are recommendations 6.1 and 6.2. The, the task force called on the uh, expansion and pro professional development in order to spur these student success uh, changes uh, with a, a focus on basic skills programs. Uh, your your assistant budget request seeks resources to do uh, do that. Your legislative agenda also uh, seeks to clarify both faculty and staff are involved in, in those uh, um, professional development activities. So, you know that's recommended. Those are recommendations six point one and six point two. Um, the uh, at the January meeting, you're going to I, I believe that. It looks like there'll be a, likely there'll be conversations about adopting system-wide uh, system-wide goals, um, and and the chancellor can correct me about, about the specific timing on that because we, we've been trying to figure out how to how to roll that into this. But the the next step building on the, the work on the scorecard is to is to bring forward that conversation about establishing system-wide goals in terms of perform, improved performance uh, across the colleges. Followed by the the next next phase of that, which will be having the colleges develop their own local goals that are aligned with that statewide goal. So those are that's recommendation 7.2. Uh, you'll see progress on that in the next year. And um, lastly, I, I would I would just note the um, um, on recommendation 7.1, which is to, to build capacity in the in the chancellor's office uh, to help support the implementation of, of these success initiatives. And uh, we are, um, you know, I, I would link that w both with uh, um, the uh, the foundation's presentation about the the Kresge grant, trying to uh, re uh, secure funds to support a student success center, would be one way to move this uh, this recommendation forward. Uh, in addition, the um, we, we are in conversations with the uh, with the administration about other other strategies for strengthening the chancellor's office uh, to. to to support further implement, implementation of the student success efforts. So with that, I, I conclude my uh, presentation. Obviously, it's a, uh, there's a whole lot of content there. It re reflects a lot of work by many, many people. And I, I hope that you feel proud about that work because it was really your leadership that allowed all of this to roll forward. And it has tremendous momentum, and there's, there are even better things ahead. So, Thank you, Vice Chancellor Skinner. We, we indeed are very proud of what we've managed to do over the last uh, couple of years almost now um, since we approved uh, the, the Student Success Task Force recommendations. Uh, questions or comments? Member Belansky? Just uh, the first question is on 7.1. It says five positions are added. Are those in process at the moment? Or I didn't kind of get whether you said that or not. Yes, the, the, the five positions that were added were, were funded in the budget and they are in the process of being filled, okay. um, some have been filled. Others are on the verge of being filled. Those will support the online ed initiative, the adult ed uh, ex uh, reforms. But in addition, we're also in conversation about seeking additional fund more. positions in the in, in the uh, in the future to support more of this. Yeah. And with seven point three, I would just simply know, and I think people need to kind of get that word out there more too, that this can help with accreditation data that's required in accreditation reports, and particularly for the annual data report that's required from every college to accreditation, where now they're ex expected to set some benchmarks. And if you used this system and used it to do the benchmarks, it would make it a lot easier and uh, transparent. And 7.4, because uh, this one's a little, I guess, new to me about the fact that community colleges, UC, CSU, EDD, and CDE are all working together for a database. Is it possible just to say some kind of data, just not in depth, but a, a data that would become available that's not in a database at the moment? I, I would refer that question to Vice Chancellor Perry to probably give the most and maybe co cogent response. Maybe he's already said this, and I just... Is this working? Okay. We are actually working with um, the other segments currently. Uh -huh. uh, the, the process of setting up a common database amongst all the segments is, is rather stalled at the moment due to lack of funding and general oversight. 
Um, we're focusing on just originally getting student data that already is in a database together so we can do work there. Um, are you talking about other qualitative data or? Just curious what, it would, what you're projecting it would look like and what would become available when it's done. I mean, we would start with what exists in our, in our domain, um, trying to get, you know, K-12 information, test scores, CSUs, and UC student records, and, and do what we can do with that. Beyond that, there might be survey data that we can, you know, further pursue or student satisfaction data, things like that. Um, but at the moment, the project is a little okay. stalled. If, if, and if I, if, if I could just briefly add, I, I think that a key feature is the ability to, to look at student outcomes across their a student's career in the various systems. There, there's a lot of information. We Once a student transfers to CSU, it's difficult for us to peer through that curtain and get that information. Well, that's, that's very critical for us to know that if we're really understanding the scope of the, of the outcomes of our students. Vice President Baum. I want to build on something that Member Belinsky said earlier in reference to some of the items that were listed as having been completed and that one of, uh, when we do best practices, we disseminate them to the system, but I think it's incumbent upon us as, uh, as the Board of Governors and the system-wide to ensure that it, once it's been disseminated, it's actually being monitored for, uh, for implementation as well. I don't want to see a check mark and say, okay, we don't have to worry about that one anymore. Uh, and, uh, and therefore, uh, I hope that we're developing ways to monitor the implementation as, as we uh, um, evaluate the, these things. Well, I, I'd just say that the proof is in that scorecard. If three, four, five years down the road, those numbers haven't changed, then mm -hmm. we haven't succeeded. Okay. So we absolutely are going to pay a lot of attention, not only at the, at the global level, but on the college by college. But that said, it's a, a really great progress, yeah, and yeah. I, I share everybody's pride uh, in what we've been able to achieve. Any other questions or comments? Thank you, Vice Chancellor Skinner. Appreciate it very much. Okay. And now we'll move on to the uh, strategic uh, system strategic plan, Chancellor. Thank you, uh, President Baca, members of the board. Uh, I uh, am going to take the next few minutes to uh, quickly remind the board that um, driving not only the student success initiative, but the other things going on in the chancellor's office is a overall strategic plan. And I would remind the board that uh, the plan was originally done in 2006, and then uh, earlier this year, Rather than uh, redo that entire process, uh, the board, I think, wisely elected to update or refresh the plan. And uh, I would simply remind you that that plan includes five component parts. The first one is the protection and the enhancement of not only uh, awareness but access to our colleges. Uh, obviously, the, the one that we are uh, hearing a lot about uh, in the last day or two, the enhancement of the success of uh, students and the readiness of them to come to college and specifically to close those performance gaps. Uh, thirdly, uh, the partnership for economic and workforce development that um, we uh, have with the employer community, with the civic and business leadership uh, throughout the state. Um, in order to accomplish those things, we simply must have an effective system here at the Chancellor's Office. And then finally, all of these require a certain level of enhanced resources. Um, I would remind the board that uh, the report I'm going to make now will not go back over plowed ground for the report you've just heard on the Student Success Initiative or for many of the reports you've heard in the last couple of days. What I'm going to try to do is pick out the pieces that we haven't talked about in the last day or two so we can knit this together. And, and just as an example of that, under the uh, first area, College Awareness and Access, uh, three of those, the first three, were all included in the student success uh, and uh, initiative and, and therefore in the report you just received. However, the couple of them that weren't included there, the first one, multiple delivery methods, and again, I would remind you that uh, the governor uh, funded uh, and the legislature approved an initiative for online education, and yesterday on your consent uh, agenda, you approved a 16 plus million dollar contract with uh, De Anza, Foothill De Anza, to begin the work on that common portal. So that's a, 
an example of that particular part of our strategic plan that wasn't covered in the Student Success Initiative, but is certainly underway. Uh, the other thing is uh, institutional capacity for diversity. I'd remind the board that during the tough years, uh, we suspended the requirement for the college to produce those student equity plans because, again, frankly, uh, the colleges didn't have the horsepower to produce them, and we really didn't have the horsepower here to do much with them. However, now that the funding's coming back, Linda Michalowski and her team have begun to reactivate those student equity plans and to uh, merge them with the student success activity. So in October of this coming year, you will have those newly revised student equity plans as part of the student success initiative. And so again, that's an example of, uh, of the uh, board's intention for a capacity for diversity being uh, done. Uh, remember that the st second uh, component of the plan, the student success and readiness, really is the lion's share um, of that is in the student success initiative. So all but uh, one of those uh, can be found there. However, the item number four, intersegmental transfer, I just remind the board that uh, the 1440 report you heard yesterday certainly does uh, give you an idea of how that's going. Uh, I, think, uh, I, I think you're going to see more and more of that. You heard uh, uh, Beth Smith uh, report earlier about the, the numbers in terms of our students that are utilizing those degrees. I think you're going to see a tremendous uptick in those numbers in the next two or three years as we get more and more of them completed and more importantly as students find out more and more about that opportunity. In terms of uh, the third area, Partnership for Economic and Workforce Development, all of these, all six of these are embedded in uh, the Doing What Matters for Jobs and the Economy activity that you have received many reports on including the expenditure plan that you approved yesterday. So I won't take time to go into all of those. Vaughn has done uh, that for you in, in uh, previous meetings, and you'll continue to hear about it as time goes on. Uh, the fourth area, uh, the system effectiveness, much of this, again, is covered in the student uh, success uh, report that you've received. However, a couple of those, uh, regulatory reform, as you know, that is an ongoing process for this board. You are constantly looking at regulations and updating those and making them germane to the changes that are taking place. Uh, in terms of leadership and professional development, obviously you have been very uh, outspoken on that. And in uh, yesterday in the in legislative priorities and the budget priorities, you saw the uh, manifestation of that in terms of our, uh, our budget requests. And of course, the external relations, the, the outreach into the community uh, that's going on not only in the I Can Afford College campaign, but all of the work that Paul Feast and his colleagues do to try to get the word about our colleges and the work we're doing out in the community, that is an uh, ongoing process as well. In addition to that, a coalition uh, for higher education, and again, the work uh, being done with CSU in 1440, I'm also pleased to report that early this morning uh, at 8 o'clock, I had a planned uh, phone conversation with uh, new UC President Janet Napolitano, who um, uh, began to co have a conversation with me about uh, enhancing uh, the relationship of UC with community colleges in terms of transfer. And she's uh, similarly having a board meeting today and tomorrow and uh, uh, rolling out the fact that uh, our two systems are going to begin some work. Uh, she hopes by March of next year to go forward to all of her chancellors with a set of recommendations that we have built together. I think all of us assumed that uh, as CSU and uh, community colleges began to implement 1440 that uh, UC would not uh, be far along, and I think this is a great example of the UC, who, by the way, has, uh, uh, has done a great deal to enhance transfer in recent years, but I think they see even more opportunity, and I think you'll see this coalition uh, develop and become stronger and stronger. In terms of uh, number 10, accreditation, uh, again, uh, the accreditation task force has almost completed its work, and I expect over the next couple of months to begin having uh, conversations with the uh, stakeholders in that regard. I think in January or March, uh, this board will see that uh, report, and obviously we believe there's great opportunity for improved uh, accreditation uh, relationships, not only between the colleges and the commission, but between the chancellor's office and the commission as well. And then finally, on ongoing strategic or ongoing planning, obviously this report is a manifestation of our uh, goal in terms of the strategic plan. 
And finally, in resource development, you heard a wonderful report earlier from Kita and the leadership of the foundation. I won't go back over that except to say that um, I, I am immensely uh, impressed with the foundation board and the foundation and how much they uh, want to work to uh, support and underpin our activities in student success. And so uh, what you uh, heard earlier and the relationship of, uh, of the uh, online application process and the work done by the foundation has a tremendous impact. And frankly, without the foundation, many of the things that we've been able to accomplish, we simply wouldn't have been able to do. Uh, however, a couple of those things, uh, resource diversification, as you know, there have been some ongoing conversations in the legislature about the potential for a parcel tax uh, change in the threshold. It's currently 66 and two-thirds percent. Many of us believe it would be wonderful if, as was the case with construction bonds, that number might drop down to 55 percent, and uh, you'd see more and more of our districts passing local parcel taxes, which would allow them to diversify their own revenue. We'll see. Obviously, in terms of funding uh, for access and success, uh, without Prop 30, we wouldn't be where we are today, and I think we have to be uh, uh, pleased and proud of the role our students played in getting that passed. And finally, I'd, uh, although, as, as you know, I was, uh, went on record in opposition to 955, it certainly has had an impact on our fee policy, and we will uh, uh, see at least one of the colleges experiment with that, and I think you're going to see more and more conversation about fee policy in the future. I'd love to tell you that we don't have anything else on our agenda, but uh, we know that that's not the way a system like this works. In addition to those things which were well codified in our strategic plan, just uh, as an example of some other things, uh, you know uh, we've had a little infusion of funding on adult education, and that's a conversation that will go on in the system in the next couple of years. Uh, there are a number of legislative pr proposals uh, underway, more than uh, 1,200 bills filed, and about 120 of those impact community colleges. Uh, we do have a uh, study group under Barry's uh, leadership that uh, should later this year complete a look at the community college bachelor's degree. And all of these things uh, sort of beg a conversation about the mission of our <coughs> colleges. And so uh, there is a, a, certainly a, a plenty on, on our agenda. I'd simply uh, uh, wind up my comments by suggesting that, uh, uh, you know, and, and maybe an analogy is the best way to do this. When, when my wife Barbara and I were much younger and much more naive, we lived in a 60-year-old uh, house in Kansas City, Missouri, and we decided it would be a great idea to add a room on the back of that house. And I don't mean hire somebody to build it. I mean the two of us <laughs> add a room on the back of the house. And so we had a wonderful time planning that room. We spent weeks going over drawings and uh, exactly how it was all going to work. And then uh, on the day we broke ground and uh, I did have to have the foundation dug, it was really a wonderful time, a lot of dirt going all over the place. And then all of a sudden we had to actually do the work of building the room. And it went on for weeks and then months and then months. And we finally did get it up and closed in and then it went on months longer to get all the painting done and the detail work. And by the time we got the room finished, frankly, I was really sick of the room. <laughs> it ended up being a great addition to the family, and it was the right thing for us to do. But like our strategic plan, the planning and planning to plan and getting all this down on paper is really the fun part. We have to show up every single day now and actually implement this plan. We simply can't stop once we get the foundation poured or get the framework done, we have to finish it. We've, uh, you, have set for us a very clear pathway, and it's up to all of us to make this happen. Now, I, I'm very encouraged because, frankly, in the in the 20 plus years I've been in the system, I've never seen stronger relationships between all the stakeholders in California's community colleges. In addition to that. I have never seen a greater alignment of the desires and wishes of the administration and the legislature with what uh, we're doing to try to restore access and improve student success. So I really believe that we've been given a chance and a window of opportunity within which to follow up on this strategic plan and all of its component parts, including the Student Success Initiative, including uh, what matters for jobs in the economy, including our foundation, that if we see this through, we actually will see those numbers move. We will see access restored in California, and we'll see uh, student success increase not just overall, 
but for all of those diverse parts of our population. But we have to do the work. So I'm really proud of the progress we've made, and, and I uh, think I speak on behalf of uh, not only all these uh, folks on the left here, but the wonderful uh, colleagues in the Academic Senate, uh, the classified staff, uh, and, uh, and the even organized labor leadership up and down the state that we're committed to making this happen. With that, I'd be happy to try to answer any of your questions. You know, I have to say, I, I speak for all of us, we're very pleased and very proud that uh, you have uh, brought the, the system strategic plan, which involved a great deal of work a number of years ago, uh, I, I updated it because it really uh, fits very well in terms of the uh, student success task force recommendations, rounds that out, but built, you know, is, is really a, um, a um, guideline for, for what can be done. And the work, of course, that was done in the student success task force and the system strategic plan was the foundation, and it was a lot of fun, but the work uh, is, is, um, is uh, more, more in involving. And uh, we're, again, very pleased, very proud that we have made the progress thus far in, in building that. So it's just a matter of keeping, keeping it going. We're very uh, pleased, obviously, with your leadership in, uh, in getting all of these uh, different components uh, together. So thank you very much. Uh, Member Asumi, did you have a comment? Uh, just briefly, I mean, and to follow up on your comments, President Baca, I mean, having, you know, been on the board way back when the uh, plan was adopted, you know, back in 2006, um, you know, I remember, you know, that we had, uh, you know, great visions about it, but, and, uh, you know, it, it, there was some implementation, but I think things kind of wound down a little bit uh, after, but I think that this, um, the melding of the strategic plan, uh, editing it, and then uh, with uh, um, the uh, student success task force recommendations uh, has been, uh, you know, really uh, revived, you know, something that had been, uh, you know, basically dead for a while, I think. And so I think that, uh, you know, it's very gratifying to see that the strategic plan now, you know, becoming such a vital part of, uh, the, you know, the system's uh, goals and future. And uh, I think that, you know, it's, uh, Certainly, symbolically, I think it's really terrific, Chancellor, that uh, you make the presentation to us about you know all the things that are going on because I think that really emphasizes the importance of the plan and you know how much it means uh, for you know the system, but also for the board. So I want to thank you for that and uh, you know appreciate everything that uh, you know the, you and the staff have done to uh, you know to push the plan. Thank you. You know, we have got we've gotten a lot of support uh, from uh, the legislature, uh, particularly some some members, and uh, also the governor uh, has been very supportive of the things that we have been doing. Uh, I think that uh, continued support is very incumbent on ensuring that we continue to do that. But uh, I think we're all very much looking forward to our uh, engagement with uh, certainly K-12 and continued engagement with CSU but also a growing um, involvement uh, and engagement with the, with the University of California. And uh, I, I look forward to having us be involved maybe with the, um, at the board level in some way with those other segments. So uh, might be something else. Any other comments? Thank you, Chancellor. Thank I appreciate you. that. Thank you. Um, let me last bring it. Uh, we'll move on to board reports. Um, Start with student member Barrera. No report. No report. No report. No report. Oh, okay. <laughs> member Malumet. Okay. Um, I had the chance last week to attend the California Economic Summit in Los Angeles, and even though I came to it with my community <coughs> college eyes, it actually encompassed a lot of different areas. Um, and I, I was surprised. It was a very large group. It was from all different parts of the economy. And um, people were really um, energetic. Uh, basically, they had action cards. I, I was there for the first day. I didn't stay for the second. And um, yeah, they were supposed to hand in their action cards with what they're committed to do. So I'll be very interested to hear the final report when it comes, or read the final report when it comes out. Um, but it was very exciting for our world, uh, workforce development, career technical education. Um, I did have a friend who attended the infrastructure one, and he was a little 
uh, less optimistic because what he needs is more related to dollars. So for us, it was a different view. But thank you very much for inviting me, Vice Chancellor. And then I was thinking about um, some of the time I've spent in Washington, D.C. has not really been um, education related. And right now, the hot topic is health care and, and uh, the shutdown. But I was thinking one of the interesting people that I did have a chance to hear speak, and I'll just share it a few sentences, um, is a woman named Dr. Deborah Frank, who runs a failure to thrive clinic for pediatric patients in Boston. And she talked about this thing called food insecurity. And she said that um, one out of four people in our country have food insecurity, and uh, they don't know, know where their food's coming from. And she, and she was talking about it from the perspective of how the federal government funds one out of four of these people for federal food programs, and how it affects the developing child for their life and their brain power. Um, and she was talking about how some of these programs are being cut back right now. But it was very interesting as a doctor to think about how many patients come and see me, and I'll just share it for students. You know, how many students are coming in that have food insecurity and how that affects their brain power for school and work. So um, she's out there talking about it and trying to influence um, Congress members to support food programs, because even though we're a country that's high in food, we're not always getting it to the people that need it. And when we don't have enough when we're young, it makes a big difference for the rest of your life. So I thought that was very interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Member Hawk. Thank you. Uh, as the uh, year ends, I'd, I'd just like to take a moment to encourage everybody to honor your friends and family, uh, your busy schedules we all do. Take that time out and celebrate however you choose to the holidays coming up at the uh, end of this year. And I hope to see you all in the uh, new year. Take care. Member Sumi. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I second that, Member Hawkins. I think that is a, you know, absolutely lovely and important sentiment. <laughs> um, I just would, uh, you know, a number of uh, things. Uh, uh, as uh, President Baca mentioned, uh, he and I were both on the, the conference call, you know, with <coughs> veteran uh, service leaders, you know, throughout the state. and. Uh, you know, it was a very uh, interesting, informative call, uh, call, which I think you know is going to lead to some important action. And uh, you know, I think that uh, you know it's going to be very good for the board, you know, to uh, work with the folks who are on this call. And uh, I know that President Baca and I are, you know, uh, committed to you know um, making sure that uh, you know these um, uh, endeavors go forward. Uh, another another example of the Army and the Marines cooperating. <laughs> <laughs> I also, uh, uh, in, the, in the veterans line, uh, I also participated in a ribbon cutting ceremony for the opening of Sierra College's new Veterans Center, uh, which just opened up last week. And so I want to thank, uh, first of all, uh, uh, Mike McGee from the Chancellor's staff in, in Vince Stewart's uh, unit, who uh, facilitated my uh, attendance and uh, being uh, included in the ribbon cutting for the center. It's a fabulous center, so if anybody you know has a chance to go out there, it just shows a commitment uh, by the college and the district uh, to uh, uh, veterans, and uh, it uh, uh, received a lot of coverage. Uh, had uh, one of the great things was I, I met a 97-year-old uh, veteran, who uh, Japanese American, who was a member of the 442nd uh, Combat Infantry uh, team that uh, you know was most decorated in World War II, and. Uh, you know, he uh, he was there and was interviewed by the local news, but uh, it was amazing to you know be able to chat with somebody like that. You know, born in 1916, mm -hmm. and uh, you know uh, yeah. still a vital part uh, you know of the community, but as, uh, that college where he had worked for many years. So that was very inspiring. So thank you very much for uh, to, uh, to Chancellor's staff. Uh, I also attended the uh, uh, foundation board meeting uh, and uh, wanted. To Compliment again, President Baca, who spent a whole day, you know, uh, uh, there uh, sitting with us at the foundation meeting, and you know, his input was very important to our discussions on a whole range of issues. So I appreciate that. And uh, f uh, finally, I want to congratulate uh, Barry Russell on his uh, uh, new appointment. I know that all of us on the board are going to really miss you, Barry. And uh, you know, but we, 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 like the chancellor said, we wish you the very best. And I know I personally wish you the very best. So you know, uh, we look forward to hearing about uh, you know uh, you, you, what happens under your leadership there at the college. Um, and finally, I wanted to um, you know as uh, serving as uh, two terms as president, and I'm sure that um, 
President Baca and also Debbie Malumet, who also served as president, we all f <laughs> feel that, you know, uh, um, how important and Jerry Griffin had been to us mm -hmm. during mm -hmm. our pr various presidencies. Yes. You know, it's, uh, I mean, all of us have, uh, when we were present, had, you know, you know, big issues that came up. I know under, when I was present, it was, uh, you know, selection of new chancellor, you know, Jack Scott, and there was a lot of things going on. We needed a lot of help, and, uh, you know, and Jerry was always there to provide that assistance to us and to me and uh, the rest of the board. But, uh, you know, we could not have been able to do all of that without, uh, you know, her mm -hmm. important help in the, in the process. And uh, so I am indebted to her uh, for all the things mm -hmm. she did for me and for the board, you know, mm -hmm. during all these years. So mm -hmm. thank you very much, and Jerry. And that concludes my report. Thank you very much. Member Blank. Uh, I'll start off by saying that since our last uh, meeting, uh, I had the good fortune to attend the Student Success and Support Summit that was held here in Sacramento. And it really was very amazing. I mean, all 112 community colleges were represented. There were well over 700 people that attended. And I can't even begin to think of all of the names of people here in the Chancellor's Office that put off on that kickoff summit. And what they did at the very beginning I thought was critical. Uh, they held the, a general session and went through the nuts and bolts of the entire program and what that means for the individual colleges and the kinds of work that lies ahead in order to make sure that we are doing the kinds of things to make students successful. Very well done. The, pre the breakouts were very well done. And then I had the opportunity to go to the RP Group Student Success Conference. Again, uh, <laughs> the amount of people that were there and the amount of focus on this student success and support program was just very amazing to the, to the point again that there was a lot of information being shared that people could take back to their colleges and use. Uh, one of the things, though, I will say that caught my attention is, is that a lot of what will be involved in this is, uh, involves technology. For example, that you have to move from doing a paper SCP, which you would fill out with a student and make a photocopy and put it in their file, to an electronic online SCP, and, and I could go through any number of other things that are going to involve a real look at many colleges in terms of technology and how to do this at the college. Uh, and what struck me is that large colleges that have more people and more IT people and more counselors and on and on seem to be moving more quickly than a small college that tends to have less staff and has to produce the same kind. And I don't mean that as a negative, just kind of as a perception of uh, something that we may need to think about throughout the state about how to help some of the, hopefully the grants that we approve that some of those will happen quickly. Uh, even the Academic Senate uh, plenary last week, a number of those sessions were on the Student Success and Support Program. Uh, I listened, for example, in one session to two counselors from Golden West, Yvonne Valenzuela and uh, Stephanie Dumont, and I was like my draw jobbing, where are you people getting all this time to do all of this work? Be but it, what was very clear with what they said was, we want students to be successful, and we're going to do what we have to do to do that. Uh, to thank uh, Vice Chancellor Perry for his presentation, uh, I do need to pick his brain sometime to figure out where he gets all of this creativity and insight. Uh, very well done. And just a couple of things at the end that um, caught my attention because of some things at the Academic Senate Plenary, because uh, there was a a motion, a resolution, which I know President Smith and Vice President Morse uh, will be working with. Um, just one, as an example, uh, to look at audit fees for performance courses. So that as, you know, repeatability has changed, and as we have these performance courses in music and maybe studio art, uh, where there's lots of space at the college, but you're not filling it as much anymore, 
whether we could have higher audit fees uh, as a way of really paying for that and getting the college some money and having people come. And sometimes I think that it would even be helpful at some colleges uh, if we even had a clearer model for them to use of how to do fee-based courses because I think sometimes I see that they walk away from that not knowing how to fully calculate what it costs to put the course on. And I've, with that, and I will just stop and do what other people have done to say thank you to Njiri for all her work and uh, for much success as she continues on her career path. And to say to Dr. Russell, uh, good luck and keep everything focused on good planning at your new college. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll stop by offering my condolences to Vice Chancellor Mikulowski, uh on the loss of her mother. I think that uh, that can be pretty heartbreaking uh, and to offer my condolences. Member Reed. Um, I attended a session on linked learning that was conducted by uh, Chris Cabaldron recently in the San Joaquin Valley and uh, I was so pleased to hear at the end of the session they introduced uh, JP Morgan as a sponsor along with the Irvine Foundation and linking it back through uh, our foundation here on the board and being a participant in that funding and I might just remind the board that uh, a number of years ago our foundation uh, contracted with JP Morgan Chase we now have approximately $88 million with them in both the nursing program and the OSHA monies. But to see them come back and reinvest with us <coughs> another million, and I think it's a million and a quarter uh, to fund link learning is, is really encouraging. And, and I just wanted to share with the board that and that. Thank you. And a newly elected Vice uh, President yeah. Baum, congratulations. No, thank you. I, no, I did want to express my deep personal appreciation to my colleagues on the board for uh, uh, the vote of confidence in our, in, in my service as uh, Vice President. Look forward to uh, fulfilling the, the responsibilities. And uh, also uh, just, and Jerry almost had, had me crying <laughs> when she was uh, <laughs> expressing her uh, uh, relationship, her feelings about being honored by the board, and, and I do feel that, uh, as, as others have said, that it is, our work is, has been made possible by your support, and, uh, and that's helpful, and, and best wishes to Barry, and he's been a, a great uh, resource for me, not only in uh, here on, uh, in the cha and the work on the Board of Governors, but in my service at Pasadena, and uh, for the continuing collaborations. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, we do have uh, a public comment. Yes. So we're opening a public forum, and uh, <coughs> we have a card from Rich Copenhagen. Rich, I thought you'd moved on. Nice <laughs> <laughs> <I> try. <laughs> yeah, we get rid of it. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I am transferring next fall. It's okay. It'll happen. Peralta. Anyway, so uh, for all of you, my name is Rich Copenhagen. I am the president of the Student Center for California Community Colleges. Um, and I want to actually start off by thanking the board uh, and, and also thanking Ann Jury. She's been an incredible resource for me, but also thank you to the board for uh, your support for the work that the Student Senate does and your continued um, engagement in the work of the students and making sure that we're involved in all of the decisions that are being made um, at the state level. <clears throat> um, I've had a really great experience being president and, and before that being a senator on the Student Senate. Um, in part because of all the support that you have given us. I, I wanted to um, read you a quote from an article that I got uh, linked on my Facebook. Uh, a day ago, one of, one of our colleagues from last year who now works in Washington, D.C., sent me an article um, that was published by uh, the Community College Times, which is a publication of the American Association of Community Colleges. And the title of the article is In in California, low community college fees face scrutiny. And an individual from uh, Colorado is quoted at the end of the article saying, quote, in the 20th century, we were trying to encourage people to go to college, and that made a heck of a lot of sense in the 1960s when California was a wealthy state. Today, California is no longer a wealthy state, and we are turning people away from college who want to come. What we have now is a low-cost pricing scheme that is starving the system and doesn't make sense in the 21st century. 
Uh, I would suggest to the board that that is a, an artificial debate that has been constructed around a problem that doesn't really exist. And over my last two and a half years here in the system, I've come across a large number of these um, uh, falsehoods that are presented as legitimate problems and therefore drive some sort of reform that really is to no one's benefit, especially not our systems. Uh, in fact, they are generally attacks on the equity uh, which our system is built in the state and the infrastructure that our system has built for California uh, that is unparalleled in the world. Uh, California is such a large economy um, and such an important piece of America and, and the global uh, economy because of our community college system and the equity that we have built. Um, and, and in my last address, my final address to the Board of Governors in your public comment as the President of the Student Senate, I want to ask the Board, as, <clears throat> as our youth are being murdered in the streets, as our families are starving because of slashed programs, because our communities are no longer able to be supported by businesses, because we have turned away 500,000 students from our system, as our youth are being sent to prison simply for trying to survive because they have no other option, that this board, the leaders of our system, all of you here, and those of us who aren't here today, that you stand guardian for us, for our students, for our faculty, and our staff against the insidious corrosion of our system by those who would seek to take advantage of us and destroy one of the most beautiful things in the nation. Thank you. Thank you, Reggie. Thank you very much. Uh, there is uh, no new business. So um, with that, uh, our next meeting is in January. Have a very wonderful, happy holidays. Meeting adjourned. Thank you.